morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? It is really good to be with you here at Fishhawk Fellowship Church as people come in. We just want to welcome you. Welcome to Fishhawk. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here. Just want to welcome you. And uh, for some of you, this is your very first experience at Fishhawk Fellowship. We just want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being a part of today's service. Can we just give God praise for all of those that are visiting today? Welcome to you. It's going to be a great day in the house of the Lord. Um, so before we get going today, I just want to mention to everyone, you might be new here, uh, might be first, second, third time. We just want to invite you over into our next steps area. That's going to be to your left and to my right at the end of the service. And over there, you can get, if you're a guest of ours, we would love to give you a gift just for being with us here today. Um, or, or maybe you just wanna learn more about uh, taking next steps here at the church, uh, whether it's joining a group or, or learning what it means to become a member of our church. We can help answer all those questions over in our next steps area and help guide you in some of those conversations. So we'd love to see you over there. And uh, we also just wanna say how thankful we are for all of those who commit to give to this church uh, every single week. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thanks for your generosity and just your obedience to Jesus in, in giving. And uh, we want to let you know that it's really easy to give here at the church. There's a couple of giving boxes that are connected to those back walls and a side wall over here. And also you can give online on our website and, uh, and through, our, through our new app. And so we'd love for you to download that app. And uh, it's called Church Center through the App Store. And then you type in our church, Fishhawk Fellowship, and it's right there for you. And it has sermons and notes and all the events that are happening in life of our church. And you can find a place to give. So it's going to be a good day in the house of the Lord. We get to start uh, today with a baptism. We got more all in the next service. But today, uh, Pastor Eduardo, we're going to get to see an awesome baptism. Let's give God praise for all that he's doing in this place. Well, good morning, Fishhawk family. How's everyone doing? Yes. Good to see you all. I'm so excited to celebrate a baptism with you this morning. So I would like to invite my brother, Brian, down here in this warm water. Come on over, Brian. Someone my height. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. So, uh, Brian, uh, I, I got to talk to Brian just a few minutes ago, and I had a long conversation with him, got to know him. He actually took our Rooted experience just last semester uh, in Pastor Bob's Rooted group, and um, man, just came, made the decision, I, I want to follow Jesus, I want to be baptized. And so we had a long conversation about that um, in my office about a month ago, and we scheduled to be baptized today. And then I just asked him today, why do you, why do you hear? Why do you want to be baptized? And he said this, he said, I know where I've been and I just want to put the past in the past and I want to run toward Jesus in the future. That's what he said. And he also said, I want to, I want to proclaim Christ. I want to pro proclaim Christ. So I want to ask you a question, my brother. What is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Well, based on that profession, Brian, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. Yes, sir. Come on. Ugh. Love you, man. Love you too. Appreciate you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. What a great way to start the service and celebrate church. Would you stand as we worship together? Somebody shout, the joy of the Lord is our strength. One more time, shout it out. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Here we go. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, everybody, sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance. Hearts, 
song will rise. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise. My song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise. My song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you. Though the waters rise, I'll still lift my eyes. something that's really exciting in the life of our church. Uh, so again, welcome to all of those. It seems like this place has doubled in the past 10 minutes. And so welcome to everyone who's here. 
so grateful to have you here at Fishhawk Fellowship Church. Uh, today, I just wanna take a moment to celebrate uh, one of our key staff members, one of these people that just helps move our church forward in so many ways. Uh, Katie Alexander is celebrating two years this month at our church, and so I just wanna celebrate Miss Katie, yay! Woo! <laughs> She's like, what? Get off of her. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Miss Katie, she, if you don't know, she's our women's director, and uh, she came on our staff and uh, has just been blazing a trail for women all throughout uh, different ministries. And, and what I love about Miss Katie is she doesn't make the ministry about her, about, you know, putting herself at the center. She just wants to raise up uh, a generation of leaders in our church that can then raise up uh, more leaders in our church. And she's just the best team builder on on the planet. And so I am really grateful for, for Katie and all that she is, all that she brings to our team. And over the past couple of years, we've been watching her and just seeing all that she brings to the team. And we love that she does women's ministry. She's gonna continue doing women's ministry, but we also think it's time to promote her, to elevate uh, her in her ministry here. And so she is this month, she's becoming the executive director of, uh, of communications and experience at our church. And so she's joining the executive team at our church. And that's a huge deal uh, to elevate uh, a woman in an executive level position at our church. And, and so we just wanna celebrate that she's blazing the trail. Um, and so uh, we are grateful for you. And it's a, it's a big task. So if you're saying, what is experience in communications? Uh, so she's gonna help our communications department to make sure that, uh, that what we're doing here, our vision, our mission, our strategy is getting out, not just to you, not so that you're, so you'll be aware of what's happening in the life of our church, but also to the whole community that, that we're here, that we exist for them. And, um, and so she's gonna help us get that out to the world. She's gonna help our creative departments. And then she's gonna be the eyes and ears of everything on a Sunday morning. And so uh, we know that there's a lot more that takes place than just a message on Sunday or worship. Everything from where you're parking and where you're going and wayfinding and um, just making sure that this experience is clear and that you have next steps to, to walk away with. Uh, Katie's gonna ensure that that happens. And so we're really excited that she's gonna fit uh, this really needed role in our church. And uh, I just see throughout all the, the pages of scripture, at every turn, you see God elevating women. And you see him uh, giving women value and significance, not just in the home and not just in a family, but also in the world and, and in the church. It was women that were the ones who first uh, saw the resurrected Jesus and brought the good news of Jesus to a bunch of scared, terrified men that were hiding. So it was, it was women that were leading that, that way. And so in the same way, we wanna, we wanna stand with God on the side of God and elevate women in our church and release the power and potential of every person to do what God has called them to do. And so that's what we're doing. And so we just wanna celebrate. This is a big moment in our church and I'm so excited to be standing next to Katie, partnering with her as we go and continue uh, seeing people come to see Jesus in this community and across the world. So I'm gonna turn it over to Katie just to lead us in a time of prayer. Um, so yeah. Thank you. If there's anything I hate, it is someone talking about me in front of hundreds of people. But You're welcome. This is a really big deal for our church, and I'm humbled and honored that I get to be the one to step into this role. So if you can pray for me and my family as we go through this, I'm certainly praying for all of you. So let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this place, for the special thing that happens here every Sunday, Lord, that you fill it with your presence so that we can encounter Jesus and experience life to the fullest. I pray that you touch the lives in this room today, Lord, that they feel your presence and that we can just enter into a time of worship that focuses solely on you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You may stand. Let's worship together. As the Spirit was moving over the waters, the Spirit can move over us. 
rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us.
ever sing. I will exalt thee. I will exalt thee. Every situation. I will exalt thee. Every morning. I will exalt thee. For you are my God. You are my God. From the rising of the sun to the going of the same. I will exalt thee. That's our hearts cry, Jesus. Oh, I will exalt thee. Yes, I will. I will exalt thee. You are my God. Come on, just take a moment and just begin to bless the Lord.
today we, we stand in, in light of the resurrection. We don't, we don't just stand in light of a cross, but we stand in, in light of a resurrection that we now, we get to experience new life in you. And so we just want to say thank you today. We praise your name above every other name. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that... Uh, that as we open up your word today, that you would, you would speak right to us. You've been speaking for thousands of years in a gentle whisper in that still small voice. And I pray that just like you've spoken thousands of years ago, that you would speak to us in a real and a personal way, that we would hear your voice and know to trust your voice because we know that your voice leads to life. 
So Lord, I just pray that we would hear your voice over and above every other voice in our life and that you would speak. We wanna give you that space today. We thank you that you will. And it's in Jesus' good name that we pray these things. Amen and amen. Uh, yeah, let's give God praise one more time today. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. Welcome to Fishhawk Fellowship Church. It is so good to be with each and every one of you here today. Uh, today, we're actually continuing on in a series we're calling Running on Empty. Um, how to refill your tank and recover your life. Uh, so what this series is all about, if you're brand new here, uh, this series is about how God wants to move the needle in your life. How maybe some of us were feeling like we're empty. Maybe it's spiritually, emotionally, um, physically, even relationally. And how God has a way of filling back up our tanks so that we can live life to the full. And so this whole series is dedicated to helping us move the needle in our lives. And, and here's what we learned about last week is we learned that cars are not the only things that run out of gas. Is that sometimes as human beings, and maybe you're experiencing this right now, um, is that we run out of gas too. Is that I have a tank, you have a tank, everyone who's watching online, you all have a tank. And sometimes that tank isn't always full and it affects how we live our lives. Now, sometimes uh, when we run on empty, it's, it's an inconvenience. Like we talked about last week, my wife, you know, stalling out uh, of gas in a, in a Starbucks drive through that's, that's inconvenient, that's less than ideal. Sometimes running out of gas is inconvenient, but there's other moments in life when running out of gas can really be dangerous. Just earlier this week, I was reminded of a story of the band Leonard Skinner. You all are familiar with Leonard? It's okay to raise your hand about that, even though we're in church. Free bird, simple man, sweet home Alabama. Um, they were classic Southern rock. They were the identity, and they were going on a, on a nationwide tour. And they were leaving from Greenville, South Carolina, October 20th, 1977. They were trying to get to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to play their next gig. And right over Mississippi, about halfway on their journey, their plane runs out of gas. And there's no airport nearby. And so the pilots, they have to find a way to, to crash land. They found an open field, but he flew over the field and they crashed into a tree and the whole band died except their drummer, Artemis Pyle. Sometimes, sometimes running out of gas is an inconvenience in our life. And sometimes running out of gas can be really dangerous to our lives. The same is true when it comes to what we're talking about today, our emotional tank. Last week we talked about our spiritual tank. Today we're talking about our emotional tank. And the reason this is so important is, is when we run on empty emotionally, when we run on fumes emotionally, it, it can affect how we view ourselves. It can affect how we view the world around us. It can affect our marriage. It can affect our decision-making ability. It can affect our families. It can affect our work. It can affect and damage every part of our lives. And God, he gave us emotions. He cares about our emotions. And he actually has a plan to fill us up. And I'm really glad for that today. So if you have a copy of God's word, we're gonna look at a story the scriptures out of 1 Kings chapter 19. It's a story about a guy named Elijah. Elijah is a prophet. Elijah is one of those, like you think of, he's like a part of the hall of fame of Christians. He is kind of a big deal. God was doing miracles in and through this guy. He did, he saw God do things that that many of us will never see in our lifetime. And so when you think about Elijah, you probably don't immediately think, oh, this guy is someone who experienced emotional burnout and emotional exhaustion, but that's exactly where we find him in 1 Kings chapter 
19. He's running on fumes. He's burned out. He's exhausted. And today in this story, we're going to identify two things. Number one, we're going to identify the warning signals that let us know when we are emotionally exhausted. You know, in cars, it's way easier to know when you're running out of gas. You got the fuel gauge and you got this needle that lets you know when you're full and when your tank is empty. And when you get close to empty, something happens likely in your car. Normally it's a light that comes on or maybe it's a light that blinks at you or maybe it's a sound that your car makes or maybe you see on your dashboard the number of miles that you have left. But it, it alerts you, it gives you a warning signal that you're getting low. But as human beings, it's way harder. It's not that easy, right? Sometimes we just, we find ourselves saying, how did I end up here? Well, this story is actually gonna help us identify what are those signals that let us know that we are running on empty. So we're gonna identify the, the fuel gauges emotionally in our lives. But the second thing that we're gonna do, which is I think way more important, is we're gonna see how God can actually move the needle back up to full. So that's what we're gonna see out of 1 Kings chapter 19. It's going to be a good day today. Now, before we get into 19, I do want to catch you up on the story in Elijah's life. And it really picks up in chapter 18. Chapter 18, we know what's happening is that Elijah is living in the time of Israel where they had kings. And sometimes there were good kings, sometimes there were not so good kings. Well, Elijah was around during a time of a really bad king. His name was Ahab. And Ahab had an even worse wife. Her name was Jezebel. Now, the reason uh, the baby name trend is not Ahab and Jezebel, it's because of these two people. They are wicked people. It's the same reason you probably don't name your kid Lucifer or, or Judas. Hey, little Judas, how are you, bud? Now, you don't name your kids Judas or Lucifer or Satan, you can't dress that up. I don't care how hipster you are. Um, same thing with Ahab and Jezebel. These are bad people. And one of the reasons they were terrible um, king, king and queen, terrible leaders, is that they actually believed in false gods. They believed in Baal, this false idol. They had their own prophets, and they rejected the way of the Lord. And even it was during this time that they had people sacrifice children to the gods of Baal. And so this was a really bloody, a really disgusting time in Israel's history. And Elijah is around for it, and he's sick of it. And so he gives a challenge. He invites everyone to Mount Carmel, including King Ahab and including all these false prophets. The entire nation shows up, and in 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah throws it down. He says this. He went before the people, and he says, how long are you all going to waver between two opinions? You see the boldness, the courage of this guy? How long are, is this nation going to waver? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, he's not, but you can go and follow him. And the people had nothing to say. So this is Elijah boldly proclaiming, it's time to follow the Lord. He's bold, he's courageous, he's dynamic. The people say nothing. And so he says, okay, I see how this is going to go. Here's what we're going to do. I want to offer up a contest. How does that sound? And the people think, oh, contest is pretty cool. And... And so what he does is he calls out the 450 false prophets of Baal. He says to all you prophets, here's what I want to do. I want to do a, a, a barbecue. And what I want to do is I want you to take a bull, and I want you to sacrifice the bull, and I want you to put it on an altar, and I'll take a bull, I'm going to sacrifice the bull, and I'm going to put it on my altar. And then we're both going to pray to, our, to, to God, and who, who's ever God rains fire down and barbecues this bull that they win. Their God wins, and when their God wins, we go worship that God. The prophets of Baal are totally into it. They're like, oh, of course we're going to win. We got, the, we got Baal on our side. And so Elijah, he, he says, how about you guys go first? And so the prophets of Baal, they sacrifice the bull, they, they build this wooden altar, it's like a grill, you know, and they, they put the bull there, they start praying to Baal. 
nothing happens. They start chanting to Baal, nothing happens. They start dancing around to Baal, nothing happens. And Elijah's watching all of this go down, and an entire nation is watching this, by the way. And he starts making fun of them. It says this in 1 Kings 18. Oh, maybe, maybe your God is just sleeping. Maybe you gotta just shout a little louder. Maybe your God, he's indisposed, which means maybe he's on the bathroom. And maybe he's, he's on the toilet. He's, he's got the fan on, he's scrolling TikTok. He can't hear you. You need to shout a little bit louder. And they start getting so frustrated that their God isn't answering them that they start cutting themselves. Maybe their blood would help get the God's attention, but their God did nothing because their God didn't actually exist. Elijah is sick of it, and so he says, uh, okay, it's, it's time to stop embarrassing yourselves. This is never going to happen for you. And so he says, now let it be my turn. But before I call fire down from heaven, what I want you to do is I want you to take these 12 barrels of water, and I want you to flood everything around this altar. I want you to soak it. I want you to drench it. I want you to waterlog the wood so that there be no human explanation when fire comes down and cooks this, this bull. I, I, I want there to be no human explanation that that could happen. And sure enough, they, they pour the water on. They waterlog everything. And then Elijah just prays a simple prayer. Lord, would you answer me so that these people's hearts would change? And then fire comes from heaven, cooks up everything, licks up all the water, burns up all the wood, burns up all the soil around the wood. I mean, it was completely cooked. And the people were amazed. It says that the nation bowed down they fell on their faces. They began to worship the one true God. And then they took the 450 prophets out to the shed and killed them. This was a huge victory for Elijah. This was like as big as Moses parting the sea, you know, through God's help. This is like Joshua leading his people through the Jordan River. This is one of those historic, iconic, highlight reel moments. He is on the mountaintop at the end of 18, but now we get to 19, and he is in a valley. Let's see what happens next. It says, verse 1, when Ahab got home, he told Jezze, he told Jezebel, <laughs> everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent the message to Elijah, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I haven't killed you just as you killed them. Now, let me just ask you, if you just came off this mountaintop moment where God showed up like never before, you just saw it go down, you saw fire come down from heaven, you just took out 450 bad guys. And then you get one threat from a bitter woman. Like, what do you expect Elijah to do in this moment? You're probably thinking, okay, come at me, woman. Like, bring it on. I, I got more left in the tank for you. But that's not, that's not his response. Check out what happens to Elijah. It says in verse 3, Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life because that's really consistent. And he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went on alone in the wilderness, traveling all day. And he sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Fast forward to verse 10. He goes on to say, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel, they've broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The reason I want to share this story with you is because we see Elijah off the mountaintop. He's in a valley. If he were to go check into a counselor in today's world, the counselor would say that this is a classic case of emotional burnout. He's not thinking straight. He's on the edge. He is completely emptied out. And the first question is this. 
okay, how do I know I'm emotionally empty? How do I know I'm burned out? What are the clues? What are the warning signals to let me know that I might need to get filled back up? We actually can see this in everything that Elijah says and what he does in chapter 19. There are actually seven warning signs that we can pick out straight from the text. We're going to move through these really quickly. Take notes because this could actually provide a really helpful checklist for you when you're thinking about are you emotionally empty or not. The first signal that he is emotionally empty is that he's overcome by fear. Check out the very first thing it describes Elijah as. Verse 3, it says, Elijah was afraid. He was afraid. He was overcome by fear in this moment. He couldn't see God at work. He couldn't see God's plans. He could only see this threat that was right in front of him. And, And for some of us, that's right where we are right now. We can't see God at work. We can't see beyond the trial. We can't see beyond the hurdle. We can't see beyond the threat that's right in front of us. And we are overcome by fear. That might be a sign or a signal that you are running on empty. The second signal that we see from this text is that we see after he's afraid, we see him trying to escape his situation. Check out, it continues on. It says in verse 3, Elijah was afraid, and what did he do? He fled for his life. Again, when we're getting close to emotionally empty, rather than facing up to what's happening in our lives, rather than leaning into the hard things, when we're empty, what's more likely to happen is we we try to run from our problems. We try to hide from our problems. We try to not think about it. We try to numb it through food or alcohol or drugs or Netflix. Or we just don't want to face the problems in our lives. We hide from God. We hide from people. We just try to run. And I just wonder uh, today, uh, what are you running from? Do you find yourself on the run today? Again, it might be a signal that you are emotionally Empty or getting there. A third signal that you might be getting close to empty is uh, you start making really poor decisions. You start making really bad decisions. I want you to see what he does next. So he's afraid. He flees for his life. And then it says, and then he goes to Beersheba, a town of Judah, where he left his servant there. And he goes on alone in the wilderness or the desert and he travels in the desert all day long. What is Elijah thinking at this moment? Why does he think that this is a good idea? He's afraid, he runs away, and and then he leaves behind the one person that's actually there to help him. He leaves behind the one person who's there to, to serve him, the one person who's there who wants to be with him, or at least is getting paid to be with him. He's like, no, you know what, I'd rather go this alone. I think it's one of the signals or signs that that you're getting on emotional empty is when you start cutting people out of your life that actually are there to help your life. You distance yourself from healthy conversations and healthy community, and that's exactly what we find Elijah doing. He's distancing himself from healthy relationships, and then to to add on to the problem, he starts going into the desert all alone. He has no provisions, he has no food, he has no water, he just starts going. This is just one bad decision after the next. And, and uh, I just started thinking in my own life. Have you noticed this? That most every bad decision that we make happens when we are emotionally on E. Have you noticed this? Some of the worst decisions we will make is when we are emotionally tired, when we are drained, when we're burned out. And so here's just an encouragement, some practical wisdom for today is is do not make big decisions when you're running on empty. Now is, if you're on empty, now is not the time to make a decision about your marriage. 
Now is not the time to make a decision about your future. Now is not the time to make a decision about your job. Now is not that time. Now is the time to get healthy. Now is the time to address that, uh, that issue and get filled up. That's what you do. Not try to make these life-changing decisions. And so that's what we see him doing. He's, he's making really bad decisions. He's on emotional E. Fourth sign that you might be getting towards E is you start pushing yourself beyond your limits. Check out, it continues on. So he travels all day alone in the wilderness or the desert, and then it says that he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. And that phrase, sat down, in some of your translations, it might be that he collapsed. Collapse is what happens when all you do is go and go and go and go until you can't go any longer. That's what happens. That's collapse. And some of us today, we've been going and going and going and going, and, and really the only option for us is collapse. One of the quickest ways towards emotional burnout is when you try to become everything to everyone all the time. You probably know exactly what I'm talking about. One of the quickest ways to burn it, burn that candle quicker than you can imagine is when you try to be everything to everyone all the time. You were not meant for that job. That's not your job. That's God's job. And for some of us, the reason we're emotionally exhausted is that we push ourselves beyond our capacity, beyond our limits. One of the reasons that Leonard Skinner's plane crashed, it lost fuel, but the reason it lost so much fuel is first, it wasn't going on a full tank, but second, they were overloaded with cargo. They were overextended. That plane was, was just pouring out fuel because it had too much on the plane. And the only way it could come down was in a crash. And for some of us, we got too much on our lives. We've said yes to too many things. We've done too many things for too many people. And, and the only way down is now a collapse unless we find a way to get back to full. Some of us, we pushed ourselves beyond our capacity. Let's keep going. What are other signals that are letting us know that, that burnout is, is here? Is that we start complaining about giving up. We complain more and more about giving up. He goes on to say to the Lord, you know what, Lord, I've had enough. And maybe you're there. I've, I'm just completely spent. I'm ready to throw in the towel. You just start complaining more and more. I wonder, when you get home from work or when you get home from a long day or, or moms after, after doing the mom thing all day, do we find ourselves just complaining to people? That might be a sign that you are on emotional E. Number six, the sixth sign is that we also begin to exaggerate our problems. He gets to a place in verse 10 where he says, God, look at all the things I've been doing for you, but no one is following you, and I am the only godly person left on this planet, and everyone is out there trying to kill me. Now, no, no, wait a second, wait a second. Is everyone out there trying to kill you? No, I thought it was just one bitter woman. Wait, are you really the only godly person left on the planet? Wait, God says, actually, there's 7,000 people who are following me in verse 18. But this is what happens when we're emotionally drained. We're not thinking straight. We just start exaggerating all of our problems. I did this in high school when I, I got broken up with. It's like 16 years old. I just thought, my life is over. I'm going to just have cats the rest of my life. No one's going to ever love me. It's going to be me and the 27 cats. We do this. We exaggerate our, our problems. And then it gets to this final place. And this is really a dark spot to be in. Another sign that you might be on emotional E is when you start wrongly believing that it's better you're not here. You start wrongly believing it's better that you're not here. Check out what Elijah gets to. He, he, he says, I've had enough. He's starting to pray that he just might die. He just wants to die. And he says, just take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors who've already died. 
So to anyone who's listening here today, watching online, you're gonna watch this on, in, on the internet years from now, I want you to know if you think that somehow you leaving this earth, you taking your life is gonna somehow make things better, it won't. If you think somehow you ending your life is gonna somehow fix the problem, it won't. So don't. Don't do it. Just this morning, someone threatened to take their own life. And I just told them, don't. Do not do it. What you're deciding, you're making a permanent decision, a permanent decision on a temporary problem. And I want you to know, just like I told this person, I want you to know today that that you are so loved. You are so cared about. And there will be people who are absolutely devastated without you in their world. And I want you to know some even better news than that is that you have a God who loves you and he cares about you and he's faithful and he can bring you through whatever dark situation that you're in. That even even in the, the most desperate of times that there is always hope because there is Jesus. And 2,000 years ago, that Jesus, he lived for you and he died for you and he rose from a grave for you so that you can have life and life to the full. So no, no, don't, don't do it. It won't fix anything. God loves you. He cares for you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. These are seven signs that you might just be running on emotional E. And it's really important that we know that, okay, these are just things. My, my emotional, I'm, my tank is empty. It doesn't mean I'm going to end it all. It means that I need to get filled up. And so the, the better part of this sermon now is, okay, how, how does God address Eliza's situation? I got just a few things and we'll be done. First, how does God respond? The first thing that God does is he gives Elijah rest. He gives him rest. Verse 5, just check it out. It says, then Elijah lay down. He slept under the broom tree. And as he was sleeping, an angel touched him. And told him, get up and eat. He looked around. And there beside his head was some baked bread on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank. And he laid back down. And the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, hey man, just get up, eat some more. Isn't that beautiful? That's my sort of plan right there. Sleep and eat. Sleep and eat. Does God scold Elijah? Does God shame Elijah? I can't believe you are a prophet of God. You, you, are, you should be the most spiritual guy here. Just read your Bible. No, he doesn't do any of those things. He gives him sleep. He gives him a snack. He lets him rest. He meets Elijah just right where he needs to be met. My wife says this, I say this, but uh, I know it's been said before, but sometimes the best thing that you can do, the most spiritual thing that you can do is eat a good meal and get a good night's rest. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you will do is eat a good meal and get a good night's rest. Trusting that God has it. It was back in February where I had a really long week of ministry, like really long. Every day, 12-hour days, and I was spent. And it was Saturday night, 11 p.m., and I'm trying to crank out the sermon for Sunday. I am stressed. I am overwhelmed. I, I am empty. And I come home, and I bring all that baggage, all that complaint to my wife. And she says something to me so simply. She says, the best thing you can do right now is go to bed. It's the best thing that you will be able to do. And trust that, that God has got you. And everything inside of me wanted to push back on that advice. Everything inside of me says, no, I gotta, I'm a perfectionist. I gotta perfect this message. I gotta get it into the tight box that I need to get it into because there's people who need Jesus and it's all on me. I started wrongly thinking at 11.30 on a Saturday night and she says, go to bed, go to bed. I went to bed. 
you know what, I woke up, had a good meal, I came here, I delivered the message, and that specific Sunday, there were multiple people who walked through next steps and says, with tears in their eyes, they say, I just gave my life over to Jesus. And I hadn't seen that for like two months. People genuinely like embracing me, just saying, I, I just came to Jesus. And what God was showing me through my wife is, is that it does not do, depend on me. None of this depends on, on me. It's, it's about what he's wanting to do. And, and I can go to bed and, and get some rest and eat a good meal and trust that he's got it. And you can too. Yes, put in your best. But you have limits, and so do I. And don't, when you start pushing back those limits, that's when, you, that's when you need to get some rest and trust that Jesus has got it. So God, he, he, he gives Elijah rest. The second thing he does is he allows Elijah to get honest. He gets honest. You get rest, you get honest. This is a, a moment where you begin to release all your frustrations to God, all your burdens to him. Verse eight, continue on. It says, so Elijah, he got up, he ate and drank, and the food gave him enough energy or enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Significant mountain. This is Moses, you know, where he met God. That's where Elijah's going. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. And the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, real quick, does God know everything? He knows everything. Why is he asking Elijah, what are you doing here? He knows why Elijah's here. Why is he asking the question? Because he wants Elijah to get honest about what he's doing there. It's like parents or grandparents, you know this, when your kid's upset, your grandkid's upset, you know exactly why they're upset. You ask them, hey, why are you upset? You know why they're upset. The reason you're asking is you want them to be able to share their burden with you. That's what God's doing here to Elijah. I I wanna give you space to be honest. I wanna give you space to be a human. Don't you love this about God? Is he actually gives us space to be human. He gives us space to not have it all together. He gives us space to not always be okay and not always be on. And this is where Elijah, the very next verse in verse 10 is where he starts just pouring out his soul to God. I'm the only one left. I'm the only godly person on the earth. Everyone's trying to kill me. He just starts pouring out his heart to God. God is not upset with his honesty. He is not afraid of his honesty. He's not defeated by Elijah's doubts. He gives him space to be a human being, and he will give that space to you just to get honest. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, that we would give all of our worries over to God, that we'd give all of our cares on to God because he cares for us. The reason he's asking Elijah, what are you doing here, is because he wants to share the burden. So when we get honest, it's the best thing that we can truly do with our exhaustion. When we're depleted, when we're drained, when we're burned out, the best thing we can do, rather than stuffing it in and acting okay, it's to actually get honest and say we're not okay. There's whole psalms of lament that deal with this. There's a whole book called Lamentations that basically says I'm not okay with this. And God can handle that. A third thing that God wants to do when you're on emotional empty. He invites you to get close. He wants you to get close. Check out verses 11 through 13. He says, I want you now to go out of the cave and I want you to stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. And it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was this earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after that, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. He went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and a still, small voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? How do you hear a whisper? 
how do you hear a gentle whisper? The only way you hear a gentle whisper is by getting close. God puts on this incredible spectacle in front of Elijah, shows him all the power and glory that he has, but it wasn't until everything got quiet around him and that God got close to him and he got close to God that he was able to hear the still, small voice of God. God's inviting us in the same way to get close so that we could hear his voice above all other voices You want to know how to go from empty to full is to be in such intimacy with the Father that you know exactly what he's saying to you. Before Jesus did any ministry, every single day, he'd go to a solitary place to be alone with the Father. And it it fueled his day. It was the one decision he made every day that changed his whole day. It helped him say yes to the things he needed to say yes to, to say no to the things he needed to say no to. It, it let him set limits in his day. It fueled his love throughout the day. It was that time to listen to the Father's voice. And I would encourage you in the same way, if you're on empty today, what would it look like for you to get rest, get honest, And get so close, to get so quiet, to be so still, so you could hear the gentle whisper of God's voice through prayer, through the reading of his word, just sitting still before him every single day. This is how God was able to bring him from empty and into full, so that, so that, this last piece, is so that Elijah could get back into the game. God was not done with Elijah. He was just getting started. And it says in verse 15 and 16, and then we'll be done. It says, the Lord told him, I want you now, now that you've gotten rest, now that you've gotten honest, now that you've gotten close and you've got intimate connection with me, I want you to get back in. He says, I want you to go back the same way you came. I want you to travel uh, to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, I want you to anoint Haziel. And then I want you to anoint Jehu. And I want you to anoint, anoint Elisha. What God is telling Elijah is, I am not done with you. I am not finished with you. I've actually got more in store for you. Just because you hit a roadblock, just because you hit a setback, you know what that is? That's just an opportunity for a comeback. Amen? And and I want you to know today, maybe you're here, and the only reason you're here today is to hear this, is that God is not done with you. Just because you hit a setback, he is just setting you up for a better comeback. So what if we, this week, the next six days, we experimented with this, getting rest, getting honest, getting close so that we can get back in? And what if we allowed God to move us from empty and into full? I have been emotionally empty many times, more times than I like to admit. But I don't stay there. I can come out. The reason I come out is this plan. And I pray that for you too. Let me pray for you. So Father, thank you for the gift of your word and how it comes to life. I pray, Lord Jesus, that if there's any here today emotionally drained, ready to throw in the towel, ready to call it quits. I pray, Jesus, that they would get rest. Get a good meal, get a good night's rest. Take a couple days if you need it. Get honest. Don't try to stuff it in, but get real about what you're going through. God can handle it. Get close. Spend time each day. The one thing that will change every day of your life, the one thing, is getting to that quiet place with God where you can hear the gentle whisper of his voice. All these things so that we can get back into the game, so that we can get back serving others, loving others, 
following Jesus, loving our neighbors, making disciples. Lord, I just pray that even right now, even today, you'd move us from empty and into full. And when our tank depletes, that you'd fill us back up. Thank you, Jesus. This is not the end of the story. And I pray specifically for anyone who's in the darkest moment of their life. I pray, Lord, that you would bring them out. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give them encouragement. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would heal their hearts and give them hope even in the most desperate of times. Lord, we love you. We give all of this to you now. Go and do in our lives what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Eduardo for a closing word. Amen. Thank you, brother. Is that encouraging? Man. I'll tell you what, even as a pastor, we, we need to hear that. We need to hear those words because... We can just run, 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 and then we feel like we're just out of gas. And it's because we need to reconnect ourselves to our great God and remind ourselves of who we are in him. And I think something else that's important that we need to realize, too, is that we, we need each other. Uh, we're not meant to live in isolation. And, and that's why I want to tell you about uh, 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 next Sunday is Connection Sunday with our church. I'm so excited. We're going to be opening it up for many people to be able to sign up for groups. We have some new groups. In fact, this past Thursday, I had just over 30 people who, were, who attended a training for new group leaders. So I'm so excited to say that we have a group for you to be able to find your people, to be able to get connected to one another. L listen, let me just say this. I think the greatest sign of growth for a Christian is when you come to the realization that you need other people in your life and that you are needed and wanted. The way that we understand that, the way that we see that is when we get connected to a group and relationship with one another. Listen, I, I just wanna ask that you would pray. Will you pray and ask the Lord to give you wisdom, to maybe rearrange your schedule? I know that sounds kinda crazy that you would rearrange your schedule so that you could get connected to a group, to one another. We want to be a church of groups, not a church with groups. We don't want groups to be just an extension of who we are. We want it to be who we are. So would you pray? Would you ask the Lord, Lord, where, where would you have me go? Maybe you want to lead a group. Maybe uh, you want to get connected to a group. There's going to be a, a plethora of groups that you can choose from on campus here with childcare or on in homes there's, there's options for you. So would you pray and consider? And then next week, we're going to have th that opportunity for you to sign up for groups for the w three weeks after that. And then the week of September 11th, we're kicking off all of those groups uh, that I just told you about. So would you pray?